Um, I've emphasized in the first lecture, you know, that this is, there's a lot of stuff that happens uh, just in your ordinary life. I saw two examples of this. Yesterday, yesterday's Boston Globe, just on the front page, uh, there was a discovery uh, about heart cell discovery raises treatment hopes. Scientists announced yesterday the discovery of cells in the heart that can create new muscle cells, raising hopes that doctors may find dramatic new ways to treat heart disease. Uh, they're showing the team showed that the cells, which are similar to stem cells, can be expanded from just a few hundred in a laboratory dish up to, uh, to more than a million, and these can be guided into becoming the pu pulsing mus muscles that power the heart. So when we were talking about those yeast dividing and saying how one cell becomes two, this is a general principle throughout life that cells come from other cells and they divide, and you can, we'll see the relationship to that with DNA replication as we go along case of a yeast, as I said, they're just always the same. Your progeny are always the same, but in something like our own cells, we start out as a single fertilized cell, but somewhere along the way, the cells have to become specialized. So the very early ones are the embryonic stem cells. They have the potential to become any cell in the body, but at some point, uh, there's, at one of these cell divisions, the cells are going to have to start to become more specialized. And for example, this one might be a lineage that would lead to the heart muscle or to becoming a nerve or something. And at that point, it loses its ability to become any cell in the body. And in many cases, by the time you get out ultimately to the final um, cell that's making up the muscle or the nerve or something, it has no capacity to regenerate. So that's why, for example, spinal cord injuries are so damaging because nerves at this point can't be regenerated or heart disease, you get a damaged heart or stuck. This is why this result is exciting because there seem to be at least a few cells in, a heart, in the heart that have the capacity to regenerate more, more heart, heart muscle. Now this is early on, it hasn't been sh rigorously shown to be a stem cell, but there's an example from yesterday's, front of yesterday's paper about something we were virtually alluding to in class. There was, oops, there was also that an article about AIDS testing. Again, you know, that we'll talk more about the HIV-1 virus. And then today, on the, on the front page of the Boston Globe yet again, as Romney draws fire on stem cells, and um, you, you, you can look at this, uh, but, you know, he's sort of trying to straddle, I guess, between uh, being supportive of research on the one hand and the concerns of uh, the conservatives and religious right on the other hand, and he's drawing fire from, from both sides. But it's a, an issue that is in our society today. You're going to be expected to make decisions on it, to know about it and understand. Just trying to drive home that this, what we're talking about isn't taking place in a vacuum. Um, nobody emailed me um, an idea as to what happened here. I showed this little movie. This ring, this uh, is water that's cooled below the freezing point, but it hasn't uh, formed ice crystals. But if we put a little bit of this Pseudomonas uh, syringi in it, then it uh, somehow that super cooled water turned into ice. And I told you it was a protein on the surface. Nobody had any ideas. So why don't you turn to whoever's close to you and you can talk about it for 30 seconds. See if anybody can come up with an idea as to why, right? I won't look, you know, just go ahead, talk to somebody, see what, come up with an idea. Okay, well, let's see. We managed to get any, any ideas? Anybody got the courage to try and uh, guess what that protein might be doing? It's a nonpolar molecule. Pardon? It's a nonpolar molecule. It's disturbing the bonds. It's a nonpolar molecule. It's not disturbing the bonds. Um, it's an interesting idea. Do you have an idea then able to extend that as to why then ice would start to form? 
I mean, it's certainly true that nonpolar bonds sort of interfere with the water. That's something we've, we've talked about. Um, let's see, any other ideas? Yeah. That's, that's a version of the same idea, I think, hydrophobic. You think he wants to repel the water and push it together. And that's, that's an interesting, you're sort of getting closer on these, yeah. Well, you said something about um, water being a nucleation point for ice and water. Yeah. So, I think have some sort of site that helps water remain faster. There, there it is. If you were to design a protein, that basically could bind water molecules in a lattice that mimicked what you found in ice. Then the water molecules coming up and binding to these little pockets in the protein would present then a little field of stable water molecules that looked to the next water molecule like it was an ice part of an ice crystal. And that's, that's indeed how that, that bacterium does that trick. It's called the ice nucleation protein, and they do things like take this bacterium and they put it into things like when you're doing snow, snow making. Um, they can, you put this in and then you spray the, the, cool, the super cool water and this makes it go into ice crystals and then it helps the, the get nice snow for, um, for ski resorts and things. That's, that's at least one of the areas where it's, where it's used. Okay, so... Um, So when I showed, I'm just going to show you this movie again. These are just baker's yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, kind of single-celled yeast that's used in, in uh, baking bread or making beer. And uh, here we're seeing cells divide. They, and they, they, this particular kind of yeast uh, has a way of doing it. it, kind of buds the daughter off from the side, some, some double and then split down the middle. But you can see what's going on. There's a lot of cell growth going on. And the issue that, I, I, that we're going to address now is where does the energy come that's needed to do that? You know from your own experience that to build things, to make things, takes, takes energy. You can't build, put up a bridge, you can't put up a building, you can't design, build a computer chip without somehow putting energy in. You're, you're taking a bunch of matter in the universe and ordering it in a very uh, specific way, uh, making new contacts didn't be there. It's an energy requiring process. And I'm going to talk today about where that energy comes from. And, and I want to tell you a little bit, just very brief historical thing along the way, because a point that I've emphasized here is, is biology is an experimental science, and many of the greatest discoveries weren't because somebody had the idea and then went out to prove it. Very often, we didn't even understand how it worked, and, and somebody was investigating a phenomenon found some peculiar things, and then began to get insights. And the insights were what then um, uh, led to a fundamental in, uh, increase in our understanding. And this little bit of history involves some names that you see on uh, the MIT buildings around here. One is Lavoisier, who is a French, um, a French scientist. And he was studying what happened when grapes were converted into wine. A nice, uh, good topic for a French uh, scientist to be studying. So in essence, what he was studying was glucose being converted to two, two molecules, uh, excuse me, of ethanol and two molecules of uh, carbon dioxide. This transformation, there's C6H12O6. Remember, carbohydrates have, the, have that, uh, that um, composition. Um, and so he was, he was studying that. He managed to figure out that's what happened to the sugar when you were making wine. And at that point, he got beheaded. That terminated that part of uh, his investigation. But this, was, this problem was then picked up by uh, Louis Pasteur, who, uh, again, his, uh, his name is on one of the MIT buildings. Um, 
He worked in France as well. There's a Pasteur Institute in Paris. There's a nice museum in Lille in northern France that has a lot of this. But he grew up in, in Arbois, which is a town in sort of eastern France that, as you can see from the, the, from the little picture of the village, winemaking was a major industry. So he was, was interested in that probably from when he was a small, small kid, although probably not dressed like that. But anyway, so he, one of the issues that he, he took on, which was a real problem, for the wine growers in, in his little town and, and in France in general was sometimes wines would go bad, they'd come out sour and they, they couldn't be drunk and then you'd lose all the, all the profit that would have come from, from that wine. So there's a lot of interest in trying to figure out how to prevent uh, wines from going bad. And so Louis Pasteur started to, to study this and he discovered that, uh, that the, there was this conversion that had been figured out now of two ethanol, two carbon dioxide. So this was a conversion. And we now refer to it generally as a fermentation. But what he discovered was this conversion occurred yeast were present, that the rate of this conversion varied as the number of yeast. So it went faster if there were more yeast. And the yeast stopped growing. When the sugar ran out, So what he discovered here was a correlation. He hadn't proven anything. He just saw that if you watch sugar go to ethanol, there were yeast around. If you had more yeast, it went faster. And when you ran out of sugar, the yeast stopped growing. There was something connected here. So he came up with the idea that the yeast were responsible for this conversion that was happening when you made wine. And it was further. Uh, helped out in this because he discovered an alternative conversion in which C6H12O6 went instead to give two molecules of CH3CHOH this molecule which you know lactic acid, it too has C6H12O6 on both sides of the equation, but it's a different molecule. And what he found was that this is the lactic acid, um, you know it, it's what's in yogurt, that makes yogurt sour. Or if you exercise really hard and your muscles are sore, that's because you accumulate lactic acid in your muscles. And I'll tell you why that is in the next lecture. But what uh, the other thing that uh, Pasteur realized that was when you got this alternative conversion, you didn't have yeast present, you had some other organism. And so that was a huge advance, uh, just an, a, a practical value to the winemakers because they knew they had to have yeast in there to get wine and their problems were coming when some other organism that wasn't yeast got in there and it did something different with the sugar and made it into lactic acid instead of making it into ethanol and, and carbon dioxide. So there was Pasteur working away on a, on a practical problem, and um, it was a, you know, a really major advance to the winemaking industry for him, him to do this. But it also then sort of unexpectedly led to uh, another issue, <laughs> and that was why were the yeast doing this? Because one of the things that Lavoisier had noticed and Pasteur noticed was that you, you did this conversion the two ethanol plus two carbon dioxide, but you could account for virtually all of the, the carbons and hydrogens and oxygens uh, that started out of sugar. It seemed like virtually all of them showed up in the, uh, in the ethanol and carbon dioxide. 
So why was the yeast doing this? And the idea began to develop out of that was that the, uh, rather than being used to make biomass, in which case you would have expected to see a whole lot of mass in the yeast cells and not so much up here, that instead most of this sugar was being used to make energy. And that somehow the cell was getting the energy necessary to do all the synthetic work in that involved in cell division by carrying out uh, this conversion. And there's a fundamental uh, relationship then between chemical energy and whether a reaction uh, can proceed. And I'll just uh, take it through in, in a sort of your typical introductory chemistry reaction, A plus B going to C plus D. Now, if this, re there are certain classes of reactions that will go almost to completion. Probably an overstatement, it says to go to completion, but it's effectively over here. Those are termed irreversible reactions. And there are certainly are, are some of them. If I have hydrogen and oxygen and I little, light a little match, we pretty much go all the way to making water with a great big boom and no hydrogen or not much hydrogen oxygen left on the other side. However, most reactions that one finds in nature don't have that quality. Instead, they're going forward at some rate and back at another, and they reach eventually an equilibrium. It's characterized by what's known as an equilibrium constant, which is the product of the concentrations of the products over the product of the concentration of the reactants. And that's a characteristic of every uh, particular chemical reaction. And we really have to worry about this uh, in biology because if everything was irreversible, that would be fine. But in order to do all this synthetic work, you have to um, deal with a lot of reactions that aren't going to go to completion. And nature has had to figure out a way of, uh, of doing that just the same way that bridges and buildings don't spontaneously assemble. And engineers on Earth have had to work out ways of putting all of those things together. So at some level, you see the same kind of problem. Now, there's a, there's a, a way of expressing this energy associated with a chemical reaction that can be used to directly calculate whether uh, a reaction is going to go or and how far it will go. And um, the person who did this work is another person who's on um, one of the MIT buildings. Uh, it was Josea Gibbs, who was a, a faculty member, a chemist who worked at Yale in the 1980s, at 18, excuse me, 18, uh, 1800s, and he um, came up with expression that's now known as Gibbs free energy. And this is what's important about this, uh, this way of ex talking about the energy ex um, associated, change associated with the chemical reaction, is it combines not only uh, the, considers not only the internal energy of the system, but also the change in disorder. Or another way of saying that for those of you who've run into the laws of thermodynamics, it combines the first and second laws of thermodynamics. And you have to consider both of those. You're going to consider whether a, uh, a reaction will go. And it's, you can't measure an absolute free energy, but you can measure a change. And this, was, this is the equation. It's, uh, the change associated with a chemical reaction is, is equal to the change associated with the chemical reaction under some set of standard conditions times RT times the log of the concentration of the products multiplied together over the concentration of the reactants. So if we just go to the same example we were just thinking about, the, the energy change with that reaction that we were considering would have been this. So 
This is the energy change so associated with the concentrations the reactants and products that we're considering. This is the energy change under standard, what are termed standard conditions, where everything, the, each reactant, each product, is present under one molar concentrations. So not something you'd ever find in most cases, but it's a frame of reference. And then this is the gas constant, the universal gas constant. which is 2 times 10 to the minus third kilocalories per mole per degree Kelvin, the temperature in absolute. This is the temp in degrees Kelvin. And the temperature for most biology, most life, is around 25 degrees centigrade, so that's equal to 298 degrees Kelvin, which is about equal to 300 degrees Kelvin. So for most, uh, and since the range in which life can occur on an absolute temperature scale is really pretty small, it sort of fluctuates in only very minor ways around 25 degrees centigrade, then for most of the biological reactions, we'll be thinking about this RT uh, number, number is, is about 0.6 kcals. Per, per mole. Now, biochemists actually have a special form of free energy they use, which we put a, a delta G prime, and that's, in this case, the delta G prime is equal to delta G prime under a set of standard conditions, plus RT natural log of C products over the reactants. But the assumption is made that the reactions, the reaction is in water, which is, I mentioned the other day, is 55 more. Yeah. This is, this is the degree Celsius. I've just expressed it in degrees Kelvin. Sorry, my mistake. Excuse me. Because I was wrong, that's why. <laughs> okay, um, thanks for catching that. Uh, all right, so, under the, so water is very concentrated. And so under these conditions, the other convention is then you can set the hydrogen ions to, and, and water molecules to one. And you don't have to think about them when you're, we're doing this. This is a convention that, that, uh, that, bio, that biochemists do. Now, this free energy, the, the, the delta G, Gibbs free energy, is a thermodynamic Property and I, I want to. I'll just give share with you. I mean the same visual image I've had since I was an undergrad, which I think is not a bad way of thinking about it. Trying to under, understand what happens that if we have a a plot of the the free energy as a function of what happens as the reaction goes along, so that we have a plus b here and C plus D down here, uh, when you go from reaction to products the way I've, I've drawn it, there's free energy, some kind of energy is given off in this kind of reaction. And the, if, you know that, if you know that, you will know then that the, the 
reaction will be able to go forward because it's able to give off energy just the same way hydrogen and oxygen give off a lot of heat and stuff, and you know that reaction really goes a long way to completion. So it's kind of as if uh, you were out here on your spring break on your skis, all ready to go down the uh, Black Diamond Hill, and it, you, know, you can sort of see it would, would happen. Now, because it's a thermodynamic property, it doesn't matter what route you take to get from the reactants to the product. So if you go down the double diamond slope or you go down the, the bunny slope, you still end up with the same amount of energy coming out of the reaction. And that's important because if, if, if that wasn't true, you could make a perpetual motion machine and you'd be very rich. Um, the second thing that's important is that this uh, the free energy will tell you what would happen if the reaction went, but it will not tell you whether it can go. If I did a demo here and I brought some hydrogen and some oxygen and I mixed them together in a vessel in the front of the class, we could all sit here waiting for it to explode, but the likelihood is we would sit here for a very, very long time and not see an explosion, right? And the reason is that in order to get that hydrogen and oxygen to close enough together, we had to give them some extra energy and push them so they overcome repulsion and stuff. So if you were uh, out here on your, on your skis again, getting all ready to go, but in fact you got off at the wrong uh, stop on the ski lift and you were there, even though there would be energy getting down from here, you're, it's not going to happen at any discernible rate given the sort of little bounce in energy you have in your normal, uh, in your normal lives. So what we're doing when we do hydrogen and oxygen, we're giving, by putting a match into it or something, we're giving it enough energy that actually a few of the molecules get up here, they drop down, then they give up so much energy and heat that all the rest of them get pushed up and the thing goes. But that's sort of a, a, not, a not a bad way of thinking about it. And when we, we're going to talk in a minute about what determines how fast reactions go, not how, not whether they go or not, and then of course we're going to have, at that point we're going to have to worry about this, about this issue. But before that, um, what I want to show you is that there's a direct relationship between this Gibbs free, uh, Gibbs free energy and the equilibrium constant. So, um, so we have this, well, what we could do is we have, you, you have the reaction over there. So let's consider that reaction has come to equilibrium. And that means there'll be no further uh, energy change uh, so we'll just set the delta G to zero. And that would mean then that delta G prime zero is equal to minus RT concentration of C over D over concentration of A over B. Um, you'll recognize this. That's the equilibrium constant, right? So, oops, sorry. There's a natural log in here. Didn't get it in. Okay, so which is equal to minus RT, the natural log of the equilibrium constant, or the natural log of the equilibrium constant is, is equal to minus delta G prime zero over RT. Or another way of saying that is the K equilibrium is equal E to the minus delta G prime zero over RT. So if you think back to the consequences of an equilibrium constant, if the reaction is going to go almost all the way, then they're going to be mostly, mostly products, very few reactants. So the K equilibrium will be large. So if a reaction is going to go a long way, then the, the equilibrium constant will be large. And in order for an equilibrium constant to be uh, large, then this delta G is going to have to have an, a, lar a large negative sign. So if the reaction is favorable, then K equilibrium will be large and uh, 
the delta g prime zero will have, at least within the scale of an activation energy, a large negative value. And let me give you a couple of examples. When we talked about carbohydrates, I briefly told you sucrose was a, what we call a disaccharide, two sugars joined together. How do we do it? What do we do when we join two things together pretty much usually in nature? You split out a molecule of water. So we take a molecule of glucose, a molecule of fructose, both carbohydrates, both uh, stick them together. We get table sugar. If we want to reverse that reaction, we have to put in a molecule of water and we can run it the other way. We get glucose plus fructose. The K equilibrium for that reaction is 140,000. The, um, the delta G prime zero is minus seven kilocalories per mole. If we think about, so that's an example of what I was just telling you, a fairly large negative value. If we think about a reaction that's not uh, favorable. Here's acetic acid. That's what makes vinegar sour. And it can just, the hydrogen ion can come off here to give you a hydrogen ion and the negative ion of acetic acid or, or acetate ion. The uh, equilibrium constant for that one is, what is it, two, I think, two times 10 to the minus five. So only a little tiny bit of the acetic acid actually ionizes. And the K equilibrium constant then, oh, excuse me, the, uh, the uh, delta G prime zero is plus 6.3 kilocalories uh, per mole. So it's some ex they're buried in this example is not only in ex showing you that a, a, favor a reaction that's unfavorable will have a positive free energy associated with it, whereas one that's favorable will have a negative free energy. This is also sort of telling you why you're you don't die when you put salad dressing on your salads, because if if, if uh, acetic acid ionized as thoroughly as as sulfuric acid, and you put a, an equivalent amount of sulfuric acid on your salads, none of us would be here. It's only a little tiny bit that's going, and, and um, uh, it's, it's happening. So um, what this really sets up for us, though, is this fundamental problem in biology, and that is that this reaction here is, you can see why it would go. This one doesn't go, but most of the reactions that you have to carry out in biology demand an energy input because they just won't go. We could sort of force this a little bit. We could raise the concentration of the, of the, of the reactants. It would give us a little bit more product, but that's not a useful solution to all the things. So this was a really fundamental problem that had to be solved in evolution in order for life to um, ever exist. And I'll give you just an example If we take, let's consider taking a couple of molecules of glutamate, which is an, uh, one of the amino acids we talked about, a couple of molecules of ammonia and making it into a couple of molecules of glutamine. Now, this is an amino acid needed for making proteins. This is an amino acid needed for making proteins. Cell has to have both of them. Um, Glutamate has two methylene groups and then a carboxyl group. It's one of the acidic amino acids. And glutamine, the side chain, is now an amid the delta G from zero associated with this reaction is plus seven kilocalories per mole. So it's as unfavorable almost as, the, as that one we're looking at. In fact, it's worse than the one we're looking at over there. 
the reason that this uh, is a, a you're sort of pushing the thing up uphill energetically is that this the electrons here actually distribute themselves back and forth. So you can kind of think of the molecule as going back and forth between these two forms, and that makes it more stable. And when you stick on the amine group to make the, the amide, it can't do that, and so you're actually pushing everything energetically uphill. So how does, how does cell accomplish this? There's energy available. If we consider what happens with C6H12O6 going to 2 lactate, the delta G prime 0 associated with that is minus 50 kilocalories per mole. So the cells get a lot of energy out of making even that simple conversion of a sugar molecule into 2 lactate. But you have to some, somehow, it has to figure out how to use that energy in order to drive these unfavorable reactions. And the solution, which is really one of the, the secrets uh, to life, is, the, is to use coupled reactions with a common intermediate. And if you look outside a cell, as Lavoisier did or Pasteur did, this is what you see. But if you could look inside the cell and see what's happening when that conversion is being made, you discover that the, the full reaction looks like this. It's uh, the sugar molecule plus two molecules of ADP plus two molecules of inorganic phosphate going to give two molecules of lactate plus two molecules of ATP. What's ATP? It's a ribonucleotide. That's ADP. And what happens when you make ATP is an extra phosphate gets added on to that end of the molecule. So by having yet another phosphate on here, you've got a whole row of negative charges. This is a, a molecule in which the various parts are not happy to be together because there are all these negative charges would like to push apart. So when you break the bond of ATP, then energy is released. So using ATP is a way of, of sort of storing chemical energy so you can use it in, in some other kind of context. And so by uh, burning it, by carrying out the reaction in this way, a cell is able to not only make a uh, uh, molecule of sugar or glucose into two lactate, it's gener able to generate um, ATP along the way. And the delta G prime zero for this reaction is minus 34 kilocalories per mole. So even though it's taking out some of that energy and putting it in ATP. This is a reaction that goes very, very efficiently. Then instead of trying to carry out just that reaction, what the cell is actually doing is taking the two glutamate plus the two molecules of ammonia plus two ATP. And then this is converting it to two glutamine to water. I think I failed to put that in here. So you can correct it back there. Plus 280P plus two molecules of inorganic phosphate. And so the P sub I, very commonly used in biochemistry to denote just inorganic phosphate ion. So that, uh, what's happened here then are these two reactions going on. This reaction uh, now, because um, ATP is involved, is now, uh, now favorable. And the delta G for this reaction is mi minus 9 kilocalories 
per mole. So by having an ATP hydrolyzed as part of the reaction mechanism, this reaction that used to be unfavorable is now favorable. And then the kind of cute thing is, if you sum this all up, the ATPs and the ADPs are on both sides of the equation. So they just drop, drop out. And what you're left with is the C6H12O6 plus the two glutamines plus two ammonia is going to give two glutamines, <clears throat> um, excuse me, two lactate plus two glutamines um, plus the two waters. And the delta G prime zero for this is minus 43 kilocalories per mole. So this is not a, you can think of it of, the, of using energy in the form of ATP like this, a little the way we use money in our society. Um, I do some work at MIT. I don't get given food to eat or a TV to watch the Super Bowl. Instead, I get given money. And then I go to the store, I give them the money, I end up with the food or the, the stuff. And if you're watching it from the outside, you see me do work at school, and then food or TV or whatever shows up at home. But what's happening is the money is serving as a common intermediate in those transactions. And that's what basically ATP is in a cell. It's energy money. And in making ATP, the uh, cell has to take this ribose with an adenine on it. I think I didn't put the adenine on here. Realize, uh, and um, the adenine sitting on the ribose. Now there, there's two phosphates, both of which have a negative charge on them, and to create that third bond, it has to push it together. So it's a very sort of unstable, intrinsically unstable molecule. When you break the bond, it'll give you energy back, and that's one of the the really uh, amazing secrets to life. And that's. The, the underlying principle of why it is that life can go, can go forward. Now, the second issue that we need to quickly address here is, oops, where did it, maybe it's here, is not only can a reaction go, which is what thermodynamics tells us, but how fast can it go? And this epitomizes the problem that all chemical reactions face, because literally every chemical reaction that you carry out involves bringing a couple of entities together. And as they get closer and closer and closer, it, they don't want to be there. So you have to sort of push them together in some kind of way or make sure they have enough energy to get together. And that's what we see represented here. And that's a special term called the activation energy. given the, the term delta G with a, with a double dagger. And that is what, um, it's the, the size of that activation energy that limits how fast chemical reactions can go. So the solution you use in chemistry, most of you know, it's a cat, you use a catalyst. And the catalyst doesn't change the outcome of the reaction. It just changes how fast you get there. So there are many reactions you heard about in chemistry. Just stick the thing at 500 degrees centigrade, put in a piece of platinum and some platinum, uh, and now the reaction will go a whole lot faster. By heating it up, you know, the molecules have more energy, so they have more energy. They can get closer together just from that. And then what the, the platinum surface would do would allow the molecules to both stick and it would bring them in proximity and also help them, them come together. We well, can't raise the temperature in a biological system, but still you have to overcome this. But the principle then, what you have to do when you're carrying out a, a catalyst, what any catalyst has, would do, is that it lowers this, this activation energy. And if you lower the activation energy, then enough of the molecules, just at whatever condition they're in, will have enough energy to be able to go. It won't change the size of the drop. It just changes how fast 
you reach the, that final equilibrium. And there are two forms of um, biological, two molecules that are biological catalysts. One of the molecules you know is, is enzymes. Enzymes are made of a protein. We spent a bunch of time um, working at that. One of the things I showed you the very first day, uh, this is a thing made by the anthrax bacterium, anthrax lethal factor. What it actually is, it's a protein, and it's an enzyme that's able to catalyze the cleavage of certain uh, peptide bonds in proteins in our body. And in particular, it goes after molecules that are involved in, in signaling processes inside of cells. And we don't have those, then we die. More recently, it was discovered that RNA can be a catalyst. And these are called um, if you have an RNA that's a catalyst, it's, it's called a ribozyme. And these seem pretty exotic for a little while when they first discovered the idea that a piece of RNA could serve as a catalyst in a biological system. But uh, it eventually turned out that the ribosome, which we'll talk about in some detail, which is, a, is the protein synthesizing machinery that creates those peptide bonds between each of the amino acids to make the proteins, it's a big conglomeration of RNA shown in gray and a bunch of proteins, different proteins that are shown in yellow but the actual formation of the peptide bond, the thing that makes all proteins, is actually catalyzed by a piece of RNA. And so the ribosome is actually a ribozyme. And it's ironic that <laughs> that sense that a piece of RNA is catalyzing the bond that makes proteins possible. So we'll finish this up and get in then to uh, glycolysis, which is the most e evolutionary ancient of these uh, energy producing systems on, on Monday. Okay?